uh, here we are uh, with our um, uh, meeting of the uh, technology and society interdisciplinary research cluster of the European University Institute. Uh, today, we have a, a talk about the new frontiers in machine data, privacy, and governance. Our guest speaker uh, will be uh, Lu Zhang. Um, Lu has a, a very long career as a data scientist uh, in the industry and more recently joined uh, Machine Matrix, which is a company based in uh, Massachusetts, where he is now chief and director of data science. Uh, so Lou, thanks a lot for being uh, with us today. Um, I will uh, take a, a few minutes just to introduce to you who we are, what we do. Uh, so you, you very briefly, the European University Institute is a uh, research institution uh, um, that is uh, essentially based on research and graduate studies. It's a, a European institutions uh, focused on social sciences. So we have four departments, uh, departments of uh, law, political science, economics, and history. And we have a large center for applied research that is uh, called Robert Schumann Center. We only have graduate studies and uh, it's one of the largest uh, graduate program in Europe with around uh, 700 between PhD and postdoc. So the meeting of today is part of the activities of one of our interdisciplinary research clusters that are in a sense of spontaneous aggregations of uh, scholars from different disciplines uh, within the UI who are interested in addressing some relevant societal issues. And in particular, um, today uh, we are with one of the events of uh, the technological change and society cluster, which is one of these interdisciplinary clusters where in particular we intend to investigate the impacts of new technologies on societies, uh, from what happens to markets, uh, to politics, to media, to the law, uh, but also in the entertainment and culture, and how also, also technology is reshaping the nature of work. Um, so in this cluster, uh, to have a, a broad discourse uh, of the impact of technologies on societies, we have a series of seminars, and here we are today, that we call industry talk, where we invite industry, people from uh, industry or the governments on the institutions sharing their experience uh, on uh, technological innovation. Um, so the idea with this uh, industry talk is really to uh, talk with people directly engaged in the technologies with their um, viewpoint as uh, actual actors. Uh, and uh, so we really intend to bridge somehow the gap between the academia and what happens uh, with the industry in terms of technologies. So uh, we are in particular very interested in, Lou, in your activities, Lou, uh, for uh, the recent developments that uh, probably nowadays go under the uh, buzzword industry uh, 4.0, and in particular with the possibility to exploit uh, valuable information that is embedded in data generated by machines. So there has been a lot, there has been a really a lot of discussion about uh, personal data, many regulations like the GDPR in Europe, uh, but we think that really a new frontier uh, is nowadays uh, the frontier of data, not from personal, not from humans, but data that are generated by machines. And we think that we know uh, little about it, uh, about the technologies that are allowed to, these, um, the, uh, uh, to exploit the information in this type of data. Uh, we don't know exactly how this may benefit uh, producers uh, and uh, what would be in the future years, the market for this type of data. And on the other hand, we already know that some authorities like the European Commission are already working on um, uh, some regulations. For example, there, there are proposals on what is called Data Act and the Data Governance Act, two acts that are meant to address 
the functioning uh, of uh, the markets about uh, machine data. And some of us also, the cluster are working on this topic. So it's very, very interesting for us, uh, uh, the topic of uh, today. Uh, and so thanks a lot, Lou, for being with us today. As I said, the format of this meeting is very flexible. So we will give you the floor for uh, some minutes for your presentation, and then we would like to uh, leave some time for uh, Q&A uh, later on. So Lou, thanks a lot for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. So thank you for the introduction. Um, I have a bit of a presentation here, but I really want this to be more of a... Um, a, a discussion and a conversation. So if anyone has any questions at any time during this presentation, feel free to interrupt me and I can um, take that discussion as well. So uh, as Giacomo said, I am the director of data science at a company called Machine Metrics. Uh, so we are a venture capital funded company that's based in Massachusetts. Uh, we have um, been around for about seven years and what we do is we are uh, essentially uh, manufacturing's first IoT platform. I'll get, uh, I'll explain that in more in a second, but before that, I want to go over the agenda for today. So first, um, we're going to go over uh, what the data is and how we obtain the data. So Giacomo said that, you know, we're going from data from humans to data from machines. What is this data from machines? What's it look like exactly? Um, how do we get it? All, all that is going to be covered uh, first and foremost. Second, what are our clients seeing once they get that data? And what value are they getting out of it? So we're going to cover that in a case study as well. And then finally, uh, we're going to go to privacy and governance issues and the overall governance framework for data and especially machine data in the US. So as I said, uh, Machine Metrics is manufacturing's first IoT platform for machines. What this means is that we are essentially a data collector and a data aggregator of thousands and thousands of different machines across the US. Uh, our customers and our partners are big and small corporations, uh, everything from large international companies like St. Cobain, uh, Johnson Controls, uh, Seco, and Altec, uh, down to small, what they call mom and pop machine shops, 10 or 20 machines uh, throughout the United States, Europe, South America, and Africa. Um, so we are globally connected and um, our base of operations is in the US, but um, this is a picture of a typical machine shop nowadays. So you can see that there's machines all over the place um, you might notice that in, in, in front of each machine is something called an operator. So uh, these are essentially people who operate these machines. And one of the first things that you might notice is that there's no uh, central visibility across all of these machines. One of the problems on machine shops um, throughout the world nowadays is that when a machine is doing something, you can only see what it's doing if you're standing right in front of it and looking right at this um, uh, control panel that's in front of it. This is problematic because essentially at the end of the day, you might not know where your production is because you have to go to each one of these operators and ask them how that machine did on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not very efficient and it's not very accurate what it's resulted in in the past century or so where this is the status quo is a lot of production shortages that are unknown until the very end of the day or the end of the week when these um, uh, when production is actually tabulated. So um, what we do is we actually go into the uh, cabinet of the machine tool. So this is the electrical cabinet and we have two devices. This little green box right here is called an edge device, which is essentially a uh, lightweight computer um, that collects data directly from the control or the programmable logic control of the machine. This black box right here also collects signals. And in conjunction, these two essentially are able to collect all the data we need for all the production and all the um, all, all the uh, uh, enriched data from the machine that, that 
we we essentially need to get in order to um, see what it's doing at, at, at all times. So uh, in addition to that, uh, we also monitor things like the electrical signals coming off the machines in order to determine uh, power draw and things like that for environmental purposes. Um, so if you want to see, for example, how much power your machine is using, you can see that 24 seven with machine metrics. So this is consequential, right? Because it means that we're monitoring these devices, thousands and thousands of these devices across the world with these lightweight computers uh, at all hours of the day. Um, so essentially it's like having a person watch that, uh, watch that machine 24 seven without ever sleeping. And that's what these computing devices are essentially doing. So why do we do that? Well, in essence, that allows uh, each uh, customer to see um, their machine's production, their uptime, their downtime, uh, the uh, status of the equipment on a very um, clean and aggregated dashboard, as we see above. Um, so each one of these tiles is one machine. And you can see things like what percent it is to the parts goal, to the production goal, how many parts it's produced over the last couple of hours. Um, things like if it's up, if it's green, it's up. If it's red, it's down, um, things like that. So all of these are essential to running an effective and efficient machine shop. Um, without this sort of data, you would be sort of guessing every single hour at what it is your production is really at. So we also enrich this data with operator or human input. So just like you go on your phone and you can um, uh, get an Uber or a Lyft, you're essentially giving data to those companies about your usage patterns. And our um, customers are also giving us incredibly rich data about their, about their usage patterns. At each one of these machines that we're on, uh, we have a Samsung Galaxy tablet where they can put in all sorts of things like, um, for example, what their um, reasons for their downtime. We can put in things like uh, why they're, they're up or why they're down. So essentially, in, uh, this is a device to capture all sorts of enriched data from our, from our customers in addition to making their operations more efficient by allowing them to aggregate all this data together to see it at the end of the day and uh, see essentially what these patterns look like. So um, in the US, uh, we essentially have uh, over five years of manufacturing data warehouse. So this amounts to billions of parts that we've captured. Um, billions of dollars of equipment that we're monitoring. And the size of each dot represents the number of machines at each one of these sites. So you can see that we're heavily clustered in the, in the Eastern part of the US, um, but we also have major manufacturing sites that we monitor all throughout uh, the South, the West, and the, um, and, the, and, the, and the Southeast as well. So this is consequential. Um, because we are essentially able to monitor all sorts of activity from all of these uh, all of these machines. Um, so never before has this really been done before, and this has incredible consequences, not just in terms of policy. So how do we regulate this, but also in terms of the type of data that we can get. This is an example. So um, this is essentially. Uh, the utilization of those machines. So what percentage of time are those machines up or down at any given point in time during 2018 to 2021? So each one of these lines represents one different year. And you can see that we can start to see aggregate trends, like a recovery in early 2021 from, <clears throat> um, from the downtime of the, uh, from COVID, uh, the dip in the summer due to supply chain issues and uh, a continued lower utilization in the second half of 2021. In addition, all of these dips that you see here are essentially US holidays. So July 4th, there's a dip in utilization that's Independence Day, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, 
um, Labor Day, M Memorial Day, these are all US holidays where you can clearly see aggregated uh, and universal dips in production across the entire fleet of machines that we're monitoring. So in addition to some basic analytics, we also do advanced analytics. Um, so what might advanced analytics be? Uh, in addition to just monitoring things like power consumption and things like that, we're also able to discern the real-time conditions of these machines, of these computer numerically controlled machines, directly from the perspective of the control and the feedback systems. Um, so we're able to create things like physics-based models that distill each tool's cutting conditions into a single number per part. Uh, so we call this our tool monitor. I'll explain this in just a second. And we can make this raw data available to the customer, allowing for unlimited customization of analytics. So what's this all mean? I'll, uh, I'll demonstrate here. So when a machine is cutting, um, essentially it's giving back all sorts of data. So this is a machine cutting a slot and um, the adjoining, um, uh, I, I guess, cuts along with it. And you can see that um, the data that we collect is essentially the torque data or the power consumption data when it's doing this. So every single millisecond, we're monitoring the data that this machine is uh, uh, essentially able to give off. Uh, and you can see how this is extremely powerful if you can do this across thousands of machines. You're essentially staring at what the machine is doing um, with your computing devices and able to uh, discern what its, uh, what its true activity is at any point in time. So the way we do that is in every single machine tool, there is a motor and in every motor, there is uh, an encoder. Um, so what we do is with our little green box, we tap into the motor itself with, um, this is a control unit with an ethernet cord that connects our unit to the control unit. And we're able to sample this at 170 million observations per motor every day at very, very high precision uh, for both uh, something called the spindle speed and also for the power, for the power itself. So um, why am I telling you guys this? Well, clearly we're planning to do something with this data. Uh, we're not just collecting it for collection's sake because we want to, uh, but there's um, some sort of utility that the customer can get from this. So what is this utility, uh, you might ask? So on the right here, you have two parts, two parts that the customer has produced. One is a good part and one is a bad part. And what we see here is that the power signal looks different for the good part versus the bad part. So that, um, uh, that uh, animation that I showed before, essentially when it's working correctly, it's using less power here. And it's using less power because of the fact that Essentially, um, it's not working as hard because uh, the tool is not broken. Uh, it uses more power when the tool is broken. And you can see that there's a difference in the finish of this little slot here. Um, the finish is much more clarified when it's working well, and it's much more gritty when it's not working well. And this is essentially because uh, there's a compromise in the tool itself. So what we can do is we can look at the, uh, the, the total amount of load in any single tooling period, and we can essentially sum that up. And you can see these curves on the right here. So these curves essentially represent the wear of the tool over any time. And um, if a tool is good, it essentially uses uh, this, uh, uh, this left side, of, of the power curve. And when the tool is bad and it's, it's snapped off, all of a sudden it dips to nothing. And that means that it's not using any power because there is no tool to use essentially. And then when it's freshly replaced, uh, it uses less power and it's able to continue on with its job. So uh, again, why are we doing this? We're able to save the customer, you know, tens of thousands of dollars per machine. Um, using this technique. 
Um, it's uh, what we call AI driven. So it's, it uses our advanced analytical algorithms. Um, there's no external sensors required. It's just using what's on site at the customer. Um, and it leverages uh, something we call our high frequency data platform. So uh, one of the quotes from our customer is that since they've implemented our predictive tool break breakage technology, the waste from this process has been completely eliminated and the savings to their machines has been monumental to say the least. So obviously this is uh, creating quite a bit of buzz amongst our customers. The reason why we need to collect all this data is essentially to help them eventually. Um, this curve that you see on the left is essentially um, a curve of machining activity. When it's good, you can see these uh, curves line up very well. But when the machining starts becoming more erratic, that's when we know something is broken and it gets worse and worse over time. So this is just the first part of our data platform. We call this the tool monitor. Uh, and um, we also supply things like um, raw data to our customers. So we do this via a platform called Amazon Web Services. And essentially each customer can extract all of this raw data, all of the 170 million data points per day per machine we're extracting and view it themselves if they want. They can download it, they can use it for their own consumption. Um, and this is consequential because it means that they have the power in their own hands to do some of the same analytics that we do. Um, so this is what it looks like inside our, um, <clears throat> inside our, our application. And essentially what customers are able to do is if you remember those tool work curves, they can set a high and low threshold on these and they can trigger alerts or notifications based on when they breach the high or low thresholds, meaning that the machine is in a fault or uh, alarm state. So let's get to the good part. What are the, some of the policy implications behind this? Well, there's a ton of them. So we, we are collecting a lot of data that um, the customers know we're collecting, but they also may not be aware of everything we collect and to the degree to which we're collecting all this data. Uh, this is true, not just for us, but for all sorts of these data companies that are around. So you may know that Uber or Lyft or Apple or Google or Amazon is collecting some data on you, but you might not know that it's collecting data based off of everything you click. And it's collecting some of this high frequency, you know, 170 million points per day type of data that we're also collecting. This, they might be tracking every single one of your mouse movements. They might be tracking other uh, aspects of your phone rather than when you're just using the app. Data is like gold in this day and age. And the more of it that you have, oftentimes uh, the more you can do it with it, like uh, we've demonstrated in our presentation. So um, in the US, uh, essentially, this is still a wild west. There are not a lot of laws governing what you can do with the data, uh, what you need to reveal to your customers, or uh, what rights the customer has to their own data. Um, it's sort of like the 1800s in the US when it was uh, sort of a very lawless state still, uh, which is why you have all of these issues right now with data breaches, um, uh, people losing their passwords, their home addresses, their phone numbers in these data breaches. Um, it's because there's not a lot of regulation. And um, there's not a lot of regulation because there's not a lot of agreement about how to regulate this data. So for us, you know, we have the right to use our to use the customer data for anything we want to improve algorithms for not just one customer, but for all our customers. So essentially, with with this data that we collect uh, for a single customer, not only is uh, are we able to improve operations for that one customer, but we can actually use that one customer's data to improve operations for all of our customers or even for another targeted customer. So think about the implication of this. It means that essentially, in addition to helping that one customer or customer A improve their operations, we now have the right to use their data infinitely unto the end of time 
to do anything we want with it. So um, the customer does have the right to request their data for download um, and for it to be deleted, but this has never ever happened for us. Uh, this is because customers often don't really um, care about this so much. Uh, sorry, did I hear a question? No, okay. Um, don't really care about this so much. Um, and it's, it's just never happened for us. It might have been different if we're a European-based company, but customers have never requested their data for download or for it to be deleted. Um, GDPR, however, we do uh, operate uh, with some customers in Europe. Um, they have forced us to make changes about how we uh, think about storing our data. So we kind of just uh, mixed everyone's data together before, but now with uh, changes in GDPR uh, requiring customers uh, to be able to request and download and delete their own data, we now have little individual buckets for each customer. And that's different from the way we did things before because in the Wild West, that was never really required. And this brings up the bigger question of um, the balance of privacy and inflexibility on one, end, on one end versus openness and flexibility on the other. So you can see that this is sort of a spectrum, right? So on one side, you have uh, an environment where it's a total, uh, totally locked down environment. So this is what more of what the EU is, uh, is about. Um, customers um, don't necessarily, uh, uh, or customers do necessarily have the right to do anything they want with their own data. They can request that it's not used to improve algorithms for other customers. Um, it, they can request that it can be deleted at, at any time. And on the other side, you have this uh, more US-like attitude, which is about openness and flexibility. So you can see pros and cons of each different side. Um, in the US, the reason why we've been able to develop these effective algorithms and be able to improve operations for so many people is very well because of the fact that we can indeed use algorithms that one person uh, has, that we've de developed for one customer and use it to improve a whole fleet of other customers. Um, this may not be possible in Europe, where these restrictions may take place. Um, this is very similar to uh, the, the US attitude about employment and the EU attitude ab uh, about employment. Oftentimes in the EU, there's things like non-competes where if you work for a company for 10 years, you can't go to another company and immediately work there that's a direct competitor. In the US, these things, especially in California, where the tech uh, companies really thrive, uh, and Massachusetts as well, these uh, non-competes really cannot be enforced and they're illegal, in fact. So you can work at Facebook for two years, work at Google for two years, work at Amazon for two years, and share all of the knowledge that you've learned at, at each one of these companies with other companies. It's just a totally different type of attitude. And so um, essentially this reflects a very different sort of um, protection regime that's sort of uh, centered in the, in the US versus the EU. The US has much more of a laissez-faire sort of approach where regulation is minimal and the attitude is that regulation should be minimal so that the individual has the most rights to do what they have to, to do with what they want with the data and with whatever they collect, whether it's in their brain or on a sheet of paper. And the EU has much more of a protectionist attitude where the, um, where the good of the whole is uh, more valued, uh, the good of the collectivist whole is more valued than the individual rights. Um, this has sort of been the case for, uh, in fact, centuries. Um, so, you know, uh, this isn't anything new. Um, there's really just uh, a completely different attitude between the US and the, and the EU here. So um, let me move on to the next and final topic, which is the overall governance structure of big tech in the US. So when I say big tech, I mean the big players like Amazon, 
uh, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, these companies that actually run these gigantic um, operations that influence um, all sorts of other uh, aspects of daily life in, in the US. So um, there's been extensive lobbying by corporations and they've basically drowned out the customer advocate groups in the, in the US. So uh, in the US, there's things called public interest groups and they are oftentimes against an army of corporate lobbyists who really have their own agenda that uh, centers around only protecting that corporation. Uh, for better or for worse, these public interest groups have really been um, overruled, essentially, by these corporations, and um, this sort of represents the diffuse interest we have in our representative democracy. Um, in the US, the reason why it's still the Wild West and the reason why these regulations don't really occur is because as a, to, as a democracy, as a country, we have decided that it's better for us to, uh, to essentially value innovation at breakneck speeds versus individual privacy uh, and individual, um, I guess, ownership of, of data. Um, so this creates a very interesting environment where, yes, we do have lots and lots of interesting new innovations going on because we can use one person's data to improve another person's operations, but it also results in all sorts of these disasters that you see, like um, data breaches and other insufficient data protections. Um, so it's really a trade-off here, and that trade-off is still being discussed and still being argued over uh, in the courts, in the public sphere. Uh, you see it every day in the news, something big happens, and then people have a whiplash where they're like, oh, well, you know, now we have to have greater data protections. Um, so these conversations are ongoing, and they're obviously still um, in everyone's mind right now. Um, and just an example of this is how, how dominant big, big tech is. So in the last couple of months, um, Facebook actually made a change to its privacy laws. And this has uh, all sorts of downstream effects to uh, smaller businesses which advertise on their platform. So you might ask how? So they essentially made a change to one of their algorithms that showed different ads to different customers all of a sudden. And uh, the algorithm had been relatively stable for many years. So uh, these companies that were advertising on Facebook's platform knew exactly how to get to their customers, knew the right keywords, knew you know, the right SEO strategy, things like that, um, uh, search engine optimization strategy. But all of a sudden, uh, with this change that Facebook made carte blanche without any sort of um, con consultation with their customers, um, there were uh, literally hundreds, thousands of smaller startups that advertised on Facebook's platform that all of a sudden lost their entire customer base because they could no longer figure out how to get through to them anymore. And so startups are often at the behest of large corporations in the US. Uh, large corporations really dominate both the political and the societal sphere here. Um, they uh, have the most powerful lobbying groups. They make the rules. Um, they can enforce their agenda. And what this has resulted in is a lot of very fast and very good innovations at the corporate level. Um, you know, there's a reason why there's a, there's a Facebook, Google, Tesla, Amazon, all of these companies started and thrived in the US and not in other countries um, is because of the fact that they really dominate and they and the US as a, as a society really supports and upholds their um, their livelihood. And so um, this is the sort of corporate environment and the uh, and the environment in which we operate in. I've given some examples of data uh, that we've collected that can be used for the good of all our customers. And I think it's up to you all to decide whether or not uh, this is a healthy environment or not. It's certainly a conversation and a continuum 
uh, that we should be discussing. And um, with that, I will conclude. And I see I have about 20, 25 minutes left to take any questions. Uh, I'm happy to take any Q&A at this point, any discussion, or go over any uh, slides in my presentation again. So thank you all very much for your time and happy to take any questions now. Thanks a lot, Lul. That was super interesting. Uh, so uh, I have tons of questions, but I don't want to monopolize uh, our uh, interaction. So please, from the audience, if... Uh, um, uh, okay, I see Marina. Marina has a question. Can you introduce yes. yourself, Marina, quickly? Hi, uh, thanks, Lou, for, for this presentation. Um, that, that was very interesting. We, you covered everything we had discussed before, so that's great. Um, so, but I was wondering, I was left wondering, um, while listening to you, you said, since you have the ownership, right, you're the owners of the data you collect, whether a potential business avenue that, not necessarily machine metrics, but a company like yours, could explore is selling this data to the machine manufacturers, right? For, for me, that, that sounds like the most straightforward um, uh, decision that, that, that you could make. And, and how do you, do, do you see your data for these machine manufacturers in terms of how essential it can become down the line to, to, to build better machines? Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. So we've had all sorts of inquiries for this data, as you can imagine, people who want to buy it, machine manufacturers, private equity firms who want to predict the direction of the market based off of this live data that we're collecting. Um, and our policy right now is to not sell this data externally because first and foremost, we're a product company. So we build these products uh, in order to better the welfare of our customers and not necessarily to sell it to third parties. So while it's tempting to do that, and while it's tempting to sell it to machine manufacturers or to Goldman Sachs or, or something like that, um, it's really not in our business to do that. And there's two reasons for this. One is ethical and one is purely practical. Um, so the purely practical reason is because oftentimes a venture funded capital or venture uh, capital funded startups are judged on one metric, which is their annual recurring revenue. So this is the total subscription revenue that you can get from your customers over and over again. And when you make a one time sale of your data to a, to a machine manufacturer or to a private equity firm, that's not a recurring stream of revenue. That's a one time stream of revenue. So that's not really counted in our valuation so much. So second, the ethical reason behind this is because um, uh, we have a, an obligation to our customers to only use their data for the betterment of either them or for the rest of our customers, uh, not for a third party that they don't know about. Um, so <clears throat> one example of how this could come back and bite us is if uh, say we sell the data to Goldman Sachs or someone like that, and they essentially uh, advertise in the future that they have this manufacturing index composed of all of these uh, manufacturers that machine metrics collected and they display the names and all of that. Well, if one of our customers sees that, that's gonna be really bad for our business because they essentially feel like they're giving us their data for the purpose other than what they wanted uh, to give us their data for. Um, this is uh, unfortunately quite common across the industry. So when you're um, filling out things like surveys or when you're using usually uh, any sort of web platform, they're scraping the data that you're, um, that you're uh, giving them. So any sort of click clickstream data or anything like that, they can collect and they're aggregating this. And uh, what it's called uh, is there's an industry name for it called alternative data. And alternative data uh, is essentially all of these data streams that we're talking about here. And they're being sold uh, in order for traders or for banks to make, to be essentially be able to make more money. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that's not the business we're in. 
Uh, we don't even sell it to um, machine manufacturers yet um, because it's not necessarily within uh, our strict focus of our business right now. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Thanks a lot, Lou. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of uh, technical questions, then more uh, other questions later on on the organization of the market, on what you do. Um, so on the tech, more technical side, I was thinking, um, uh, so when you showed us what you do with machine learning uh, via this large amount of data they are collecting, I was asking myself, how do you, how do you label this data? Because I understand that you are able to uh, um, uh, collect this data on a continuous time, but then in order to be sure that something that you observe in the data may signal malfunctioning, you need some labeling at some point that tells you that indeed, uh, when the machine goes in that, in that status is malfunctioning. So how do you do um, this, this labeling of the data? And then the other question that I have is, uh, uh, again, on the tech, more technical side, you mentioned uh, that you collect data from many machines, millions of machines, if I understood well, and, and uh, combining data from different data sources gives you some additional information, as if there was uh, some complementarity on the fact that you can rely on data that come from different machines. Am, am I right on this? Yes, that's correct on both accounts. Um... So the labeling is something that you do have to do somehow with manually or with, with some human intervention, I guess. So actually uh, the labeling is done in this uh, slide that I can show right here. So remember uh, we have these tablets all over the world and uh, we don't do the labeling ourselves. It's actually the operators who do the labeling oh, for us. Yep. So when the machine goes down or when it there's some sort of a breakage that we detect, we essentially prompt all of these operators. Um, they're, they're almost like a fleet of, of humans uh, across the world um, to tell us uh, why that machine went down and um, give us some, uh, some text input about that. Okay, excellent. Now I, I understand. Very good. Great. Um, so any other questions from the audience? As I said, I do have many, but I don't want to take much of your time on that. Marina is another Yeah, person. I could maybe ask another one, which is um, related to the, to the data that your customers see. Um, do your customers see how their manufacturing performance relates to their competitors? Yes. That is a great question. That's actually one of our products. Um, so we have uh, something called a benchmarking product that's able to essentially tell them um, where they rank in relation to everyone else. Um, so I can actually pull one of these up. And um, the, um, the, the great thing about this is that um, we have the power of aggregated data, so across thousands of machines. So essentially what they're able to see here is uh, where for each type of machine, where they what their utilization percentage is and their percentile. So each one of these dots is an individual company. And so you can see where you rank amongst all companies. This company does particularly well. Um, and you can also see each individual dot here is a machine that, that, that they have and where they rank relative to all other machines of that type. And uh, we can also have these bell curves here that um, essentially tell them what their utilization is in terms of percent and where they fall as a percentile relative to, to everything else. Um, so yes, the, <laughs> this is definitely a, a product that we have and customers actually use this to um, benchmark all sorts of things. So they can um, essentially be honest, more honest with themselves around um, things like uh, where their actual sales are performing. 
So, or, or not sales, but, but performance is. Um, so things like, well, uh, I feel like 35% is a good, uh, is a good uh, utilization to have. Well, is it or is it not? You can compare yourself to you know, hundreds of other customers and see where you lie exactly on that bell curve. Um, they've also used it to do things like plan equipment purchases. So if they um, have a very good utilization and they're already at the very top, um, say at 52%, for example, that means that um, they are essentially all topped out and um, getting more utilization on top of that is probably not feasible. So they need to buy more equipment. Whereas if they're all the way down here and they're considering buying another piece of equipment, that's probably not a good idea because there's hundreds of other people who are doing more with their machines than they are. And uh, you could probably improve your operations to be more in line with the pack. So um, yeah, does, does that answer your question? Great. Um. While you were you were talking about uh, um, the manufacturer of machines, so essentially uh, I can see uh, three type of players here: uh, the users of, of the machines that are typically your clients, uh, yourself, uh, and uh, manufacturer of machines. So. Um, what is the actual interaction? So in part, you already answered this question. What is the interaction that you are having with the manufacturer of machines? So I imagine large companies like, I don't know, Bosch, thinking about Europe, um, who are producing millions of, of electric motor, may, may already do something related to what you do as your business, uh, in a sense, in-house, just using the data uh, from their own motors. So what kind of interaction can do you have currently with these, these other players and uh, can you see for the future of, of this industry? Yeah, so we definitely do have interaction with um, a lot of the big machine tool producers. Um, in Europe, I think um, companies, um, well, I, I can't name them exactly here, but yeah, big, big machine tool producers and they are very interested in partnering with us for our technology. Um, oftentimes what we find is that at these uh, machine tool companies, uh, there's really three areas of expertise that you need to do this sort of research. Um, you need uh, good domain knowledge. So they, they have that because they're very aware of what the industry is. But you also need good data scientists. So you need solid techniques in AI and machine learning. And you also need uh, strong computer engineering or computer science skills in order to truly understand um, how to make a robust infrastructure around this. Um, oftentimes, they have two of the three. So the, they usually have good um, computer engineering skills and good uh, domain knowledge, but they don't have the third data science knowledge. So they partner with us or they want to partner with, with, with us for our, our algorithms, um, our AI algorithms. And uh, we're currently in conversation with a couple of these manufacturers in order to um, add this capability to their machines uh, instead of having it um, just be us. Uh, it can be us in partnership with them and um, have this built into their software instead of as a third party add-on. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for engagement there and for improvement as well. And I'm sure lots of uh, pitfalls as well for data privacy rules. Um, so there's, um, there's a lot to consider there. Uh, thanks. So very related to this, in fact, I was uh, curious to understand. So in a sense, what you do with your uh, uh, monitoring tools and sensors, you are, um, um, I don't know if I'm using the term correctly, retrofitting uh, already machines that already exist. So you go to the factory of your clients and you, you, you put these sensors uh, in, the, in the machines. So. I was, I was thinking in your opinion, to what extent the industrial cost of what you're doing could be reduced if the retrofit, well, actually, if the machine was conceived with a, with a sensor 
at the moment of the production of the machine itself? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's actually a bit of nuance here. Um, what we're actually doing is we're not installing external sensors. We're actually just installing a computer that taps into the sensors that are already built into that machine. So the sensors are already built into that machine. And what we're doing is we're tapping into the ethernet connection to get all of those signals and download them all uh, and use them for our algorithms. Um, so there's a little bit of nuance there. Okay, so the sensors typically are already embedded in machines. Yes, that's correct. Okay, I see. So the, the, the reason why these sensors necessarily have to exist is because in every single industrial machine, um, there's, a, there's a closed loop feedback system. So they um, essentially draw electricity to do work, right? And they have to know exactly how much electricity to, to, to draw at, at any time. And the way they know that is essentially by sensing with these, uh, with these sensors, um, the amount of uh, pressure that's being uh, given against that tool. So the more pressure there is against that tool, the more power it needs to cut. And so that feedback loop, similar to something like a cruise control on your car, essentially says, okay, well, the faster I'm going down this hill, or you know, the steeper this hill is, the less gas I need. The more resistance there is against this tool, the more power I need. So that goes again and again and again and again. And we're tapping into that loop that closed feedback loop in order to get the data that we need to run our all of our algorithms. Very clear. Thanks a lot. Other questions around in the audience? Uh, Marco. Hello, Lou. Thank you for your very interesting presentation on how you connected the I found it very interesting how you connected the, the machine, uh, the uh, very technical aspects with the broader considerations about the data governance framework and so on. It was particularly and come. I would like to ask you a bit more about the infrastructure aspect that you mentioned a bit during your presentation. In the sense that how those those questions on the the role of you mentioned about the role of big data, how how the the role of big tech, how the startups end up being uh, being uh, affected by the the reliance on big data no oh, sorry on big tech on big tech for surviving and you mentioned also that an aspect of amazon web services on your for for what machine metrics does so i'd like to hear a bit more of that in particular about reliance on cloud services if you can speak a bit, a bit more about that Yes, that's a great question. So before the existence of things like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or Alibaba Cloud or something like that, um, companies essentially had to have their own servers on site. Um, so stacks and stacks of computers. And this was very, very inefficient because um, essentially you have to have your own um, IT department that services all of these stacks of servers and um, you have to debug them. They go, they go out sometimes because of power outages uh, and then you lose data, things like that. Um, so these uh, server farms, which is essentially what Amazon data services or Amazon web services is, is um, in, it gives the ability for startups like ours to essentially scale up very, very quickly because we are using their physical infrastructure uh, in order to build our business on top of it. Um, so we rely on them to provide all of that compute, to provide all that data storage, to store our customers' data, to uh, run our computations. Um, uh, and this uh, allows us to scale our business um, in a much more um, streamlined fashion. So instead of buying all of these server stacks ourselves, we can essentially just say, okay, Amazon, we need 50 more units of compute. Let's buy that from you. And they make it happen. So there's pros and cons to this. Obviously there's a huge pro, which is that we don't need to rely on physical infrastructure ourselves. But the con is that uh, we now outsource 
our data management to a third party organization, which means that we're at the behest of um, their um, data management practices. So if their data management practices are insecure or if their redundancies are insufficient, then we still have the opportunity to lose data or to, uh, to have our data compromised. Fortunately, Amazon is pretty good at this. Uh, we've had a couple of data outages where uh, the, the data can no longer be uh, received or the customers can no longer use our application for a small period of time. But oftentimes these data outages make national headlines. So it's, uh, it affects all sorts of other applications that also run on top of Amazon. Uh, like Slack, uh, like uh, I think maybe Lyft or Uber runs on some of these as well. So all of these applications all of a sudden go out and it's a huge deal. So trade-offs, right? So yes, you rely on these big data providers, uh, but you can scale much more quickly. But on the other hand, if it goes out, then maybe a whole bunch of services, you know, half the Eastern seaboard goes out in terms of being able to do things. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Marco. Thanks a lot. Um, we are also relying at, at universities on uh, AWS services, uh, also quite uh, intensively in Europe as well. I think uh, we're almost close to the end. I just have a very uh, uh, last question myself. Uh, I guess maybe this is sensitive information, so I don't expect you to, to give a very detailed answer, but I was very, I would be very uh, interested to know what type of contracts do you uh, design with your clients? Because they are providing you data, you are providing back this uh, analytic service, and what is the net transfer out of that? Um, if you can say something about that. You said the net transfer out of that? Meaning that they pay you, you pay them, or it depends. It depends oh. on the amount of data they provide you or the I see. service that you provide them back. So that I, I can actually talk about. Uh, we have a, a very standard uh, subscription service. So the way this works is uh, they pay us about $100 a month per machine. Um, in order to get us uh, to, you know, be able to use our services. Um, and in exchange for that, we own their data and we give them back these analytics. Mm -hmm. um, so the net transfer is that they're giving us money. Um, but um, you can see how um, it, uh, even if they paid us a lot less than that, it would still be worth it for us because of all of this data that we're collecting on all of these improvements we're able to make because of it. Sure, sure, yeah, I see. So we are, uh, I think we are at the end of uh, our discussion. Um, so uh, let's let's stop here. Lou, it, that's been very, very interesting. Uh, thanks a lot for your uh, um, uh, talk and your interaction with us today. Uh, as I said, uh, some of us are working on this, so we will probably follow uh, uh, back to you with, with the, to some stuff that may come out of these uh, uh, interdisciplinary research clusters and uh, in general research from social scientists uh, on the topic. So uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, everyone.